to start with my story. Um, my story kind of starts with my second child. I have two. I have one who's a son who's four years old and a daughter who's now two. Um, when I first had my son, I was enamored by motherhood. I saw all these movies and heard a lot of stories from my friends who were moms and just how beautiful it was and how they couldn't believe that this little person is in their life. And it is beautiful. It's one of the greatest things that women can do with their bodies that, um, that you can gain from adoption that you can experience just in general. Um, and I had that with my son. I felt like I can't believe he chose me to be a mom and what a beautiful thing this was. And I had a lot of self doubt that I just pushed to the side because, you know, that's not how motherhood is supposed to be. And it's something that I continue to push down, even though I had spiraling thoughts of possibly hurting him, um, being very hyper aware of safety and security and not letting anything happen to him. Fast forward to being pregnant with my daughter and in my last trimester feeling very depressed, something that um, I had felt before, but this was strong. This was extremely strong to the point where I was crying every day, um, attributed it to hormones. You know, everyone kind of attributes their hard feelings during pregnancy to hormones, and it's, it's a real thing. Um, but mine felt very different from my last pregnancy as far as the hormonal shifts. So I started seeing a therapist in my last trimester just, you know, to hopefully get a kickstart on what could possibly be postpartum depression after I have my baby. Um, that therapist didn't end up being the right fit for me, which happens. Um, so I had my, my daughter and all of these fears started plummeting out of nowhere of, you know, and it's not out of nowhere. It's from my past, but just how am I going to raise a little girl in this world where the Me Too movement was, you know, starting and gaining steam, um, and am I even qualified to take care of a little girl with all of this happening? And do I feel secure as a woman who, you know, is still learning to become an adult, I guess? Um, and just a lot of fear of her being a girl in this world. There's a lot of judgment that's placed on women and a lot of ex expectations that are placed on women that I was afraid of. And um, I don't know if that was entirely what fueled postpartum depression in me, but it, it definitely was in the back of my mind and in the forefront of my mind for a lot of the time that my daughter was young, you know, before it even, before she's even a, a teenager, you know, this, she's only two. And these are fears that I still have. Um, but I started to feel the postpartum depression kind of kick in. And I didn't know that this was even happening um, right as she was born. It, it never, like I thought the hormones, you know, this is baby blues. This is something that I had with my son. The third day after giving birth was always for both of my kids, the hardest. I, I cried my eyes out. People would try to joke with me and I would yell, I'm not trying to joke right now. And, um, so that was something that I knew would pass and then it didn't. And it went on for a week and then it went on for two weeks and it's just, it went on for a year and a half. And it was, it looked a little different from the movies that I've seen and the news stories that I've heard where moms would be depressed and hurt their children or, um, just the, you know, the crying incessantly was something that I always saw associated with depression, postpartum depression, and mine was more anger, which I later found out is very common with 
depression and postpartum depression. Um, but the anger would take over to a point where I didn't even recognize myself. I would get so frustrated with my son, get so frustrated with my husband and had no idea why. Um, it was hard and I didn't know where to go, who to turn to. I felt like I had to hide this from my friends because it was too vulnerable of a state that I was in. And with the news stories highlighting the worst case scenarios and with stories online that I, the few that I read, um, those being the worst case scenarios, I felt like I didn't want my kids to be taken away from me, that this was something that I needed to hide and put on a brave face for because I, my life was gonna be forever changed if I talked to somebody about it. And honestly, my life was forever changed when I finally did talk to somebody about it and it was for the better. Um, I finally started seeing a therapist that I felt aligned with when my daughter was about five months old. I went through this huge trial and error period with therapists that, you know, were nice people, but weren't the right fit for me. And, you know, in learning what the right fit was for me after this two year journey of being in therapy, I was looking for somebody to mother me when I was in a state of not knowing how to mother. Um, and she is the most gentle um, kind person who always seems to be able to articulate in words how I'm feeling. And so I felt like this was a good fit and it's not easy to find a good fit. Um, so I started bringing my daughter to therapy with me and she saw the struggles that I was having from putting her into a car seat, changing her diaper. It was all just, she, my daughter was she hated it. She hated car rides. She hated the car seat. Um, and the way that I learned to manage, or at least, you know, keep my head above water was to go out places, even though she hated the car seat, even though she hated the car, I didn't want to be alone in the house with just me and her. Um, because it was hard that way, at least if I was at target, which was my safe haven, um, I could, be around people and they could maybe help me or they could see um, how I'm struggling and maybe somebody could help. Um, but I, I felt like at my house with just me and her, it was too much. So my coping mechanism was to go out um, and try to keep her in the car seat as much as possible. and. Um, you know, click her in, click her out with the new handy car seats that they have. And um, that was, that was great for me for a while. I still cried every day. Um, but it was the anger piece that I couldn't really wrap my head around. I was like, you know, with depression, you're supposed to be sad. You're not supposed to be angry. Um, as, as I slowly um, started to open up more to my therapist. It took a while for me to feel comfortable opening up to her as great as she is. It took me a while um, to trust and feel secure that she was going to hold my emotions and not judge me for it and not, you know, tell people not that she would, that's her job to not tell people, but um, it takes me a while to trust people with my emotions. And she finally, after two months, I felt like I could trust her with my emotions, which is, which I don't do with a lot of people. Um, so we eventually unraveled that it was a lot of anxiety that I felt both with my son that I pushed down to the deepest parts of my brain and that it was coming out with my daughter and had exacerbated from my son. And I still had that toward my son, but then also toward my daughter and being pulled with, you know, feeling guilty that I don't have that one-on-one -on -one time with my son as much as I used to and having to split my time and felt like splitting my love between both kids. And I didn't know how to do that. 
Um, it felt like I couldn't enjoy her because I was enjoying him and I felt like I couldn't enjoy him if I was spending time with her. And it was, it was hard. Um, and one of the things that I had never heard of before was postpartum anxiety. That's something that it was never in any of the literature that was given to me from the hospital, never talked about in any of the baby classes, any of the birthing classes. Um, but now having experienced it and meeting other moms, they've had it too. And the way that it manifested in me was just spiraling thoughts of the worst case scenario that can happen. Um, I remember one moment or one experience where I was, I had to use a screwdriver to, you know, change the batteries in my daughter's little sound machine hippo thing. And I needed to bring the screwdriver downstairs, but I also needed to bring her downstairs. So I'm holding her in one hand. I had the screwdriver in one hand, normal circumstance. I kept having these intrusive thoughts of if I go down the stairs with her and the screwdriver, I'm going to fall or I'm going to trip. And the screwdriver is going to, you know, jab into her somehow. And then my kids are going to get taken away from me. And that's the end. That's the end of my story. And so I, I couldn't, it really interrupted a lot of the connection that I could have with my daughter because I wasn't okay. And those little things kept happening, you know, holding a screwdriver, holding my daughter, like what's going to happen. It was it was a lot. And so I ended up, you know, taking extra steps that um, maybe a, a healthy person, a mentally healthy person wouldn't normally do of bringing down the screwdriver, leaving her in her crib, um, coming back up, carrying her, having nothing in my hands, you know, looking down the stairs, counting to five, and then walking downstairs. And that's a lot. That's, I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot, but the internal struggle was very real. And, you know, this anxiety that I had around the safety of my daughter, I'm, you know, I slowly realized I had that with my son and I didn't, I didn't recognize it. I didn't see it as a thing that was a problem because it was just him and I, and it was, I guess, for some reason, easier to manage um, but it all came to the surface with her. And so as she started to become mobile, things started to get extremely harder. Um, and I thought, you hit the one year mark and this should all go away. This is how depression works. But unfortunately, it didn't go away. And so from 12 months until she was about 18 months, that might have been like the hardest time in the whole postpartum place. Um, and before that, it was from zero to six months that felt hard and unmanageable. I mean, the pictures behind me are from her first month all the way to her 12th month. And a lot of times I couldn't look at those pictures without crying because I felt like the connection that I didn't have with her was so awful. Like I couldn't I couldn't feel okay with myself um, knowing that I lost that connection. I lost that time with her. And so um, I forced myself to put the pictures back up so that I can see her and love myself and give myself grace um, and know that what I was feeling isn't something that is new to the world. This is something that happens in a lot of women. One in four women experience postpartum depression. I know more than four moms and none of them have really expressed that until I met a lot of moms in this motherhood in the raw group. It's, it's very empowering to feel like I'm understood. It's very empowering to know that this isn't something that you need to feel alone in. Um, but anyways, so as she became mobile, things started to change. Now she was um, fighting even harder to not go in the car seat. Now she was, you know, 
crawling and walking and my son was also a giant flight risk running into parking lots and you know expressing his jealousy about his new sister um and that's when things kind of took a turn for the worse she started walking at 12 months and it felt like i didn't have control of anything um it felt like i was drowning in a pool of my own tears um, in a pool of my own anger the anger got worse um and my therapist had talked a lot about medication and I was very strongly not wanting to go on medication because again, with the stories that come out about people who are medicated, it's, there's always the talk of they're not the same person anymore or they're not themselves. And it took a lot of research and talking through it with my therapist and talking through it with other people who have been on medication to understand that, yeah, I might be a different person, but the person that I am now, the angry, depressed, sad person, do I want to stay that way or do I want to change um, and be healthier? And I did. And eventually getting on medication was the best idea that I've ever had. You know, and it wasn't my idea, but it was the best um, decision that I made. Um, I felt like I could finally have a handle on things. Um, I felt like I could finally feel free. Um, and it, it wasn't until I met a lot of women in both the motherhood and the rock group, but also just outside of the group, meeting me and, and us talking through what we went through postpartum and relating to each other on that. That was the first time I felt like I could be truly myself and not have to hide behind a mask and not have to feel like the world is coming down on me and I'm all by myself. So from there, we started the group and meeting more and more women and moms that have gone through it from all ages you know we we've met some moms that are seasoned and have kids in college who said like yeah i went through that and you know that generational difference can be hard i don't i i guess i don't hear much from moms who are older about postpartum mental illness <clears throat> i think because a lot of it was very taboo um, and it still kind of is that way, but the, it's changing, which I really am thankful for. Um, therapy has always been kind of the thing that's touted as only for crazy people, or medication was the same way. It's only for crazy people, and postpartum depression is something that is very, it's it's bad, it's dangerous, and it's not something that you want to have, but more women have it than you know, and more than I knew. Um, and now I feel like this group has helped me heal a lot more than anything that I've done. Um, I can finally see myself and I can finally feel the guilt being lifted when I don't have my child in my arms at all times taking time for myself was always hard with my son and always hard when I had my daughter, especially in those first, in that first year, I felt like if I stepped away, I was putting too much on my husband's plate or I was putting, I was putting my children last when that's not the case. Putting myself first made me a better mom. Putting myself first helped me I guess, regain who I was before I had kids, um, getting back into hobbies and, you know, just even doing a little bit of what I did before I having kids. Drawing was something that I really got into right before I had my son and I stopped doing that and just sketching a little something um, was really helpful. And it's just those small steps, those small victories that helped me really finally take a couple steps you know it's kind of like watching a baby 
walk in a way when I now in hindsight watching how I grew um, there were times where I couldn't get myself to stop crying and the you know in two days when I would stop crying I had to give myself a pat on the back like yes you did it you got dressed and you didn't cry <laughs> or you talked to your husband and you didn't get angry um, you held your child and didn't cry and didn't get frustrated with her. And that's a victory. Um, counting those small victories and giving myself praise was hard, but that was something that really helped in the end. And my therapist helped a lot with that of just tell yourself that you did great. Look in the mirror, talk to yourself about how, you know, the five great things that you did today, whether it's, I took a shower, I got dressed, I ate lunch, I put my daughter in her car seat, even though she struggled, and I hugged my son. Those were, that was one day, you know, an actual day of five things that I wrote down and told myself, and they seemed small. And, you know, before I had my kids, I would probably think that this person is crazy like of course you would do all these things why wouldn't you but those little things became extremely hard to do in the postpartum period and not understanding why and not having anybody that had gone through it and not having friends that really kind of understood what that feeling was like um, as much as you know I, the friends that I have are wonderful people um, when when you see how perfect or seemingly perfect their journey is it makes it made me feel like oh, i can't i can't share this with them because if they don't know how it how it's feeling then they won't understand me um and it's it became very depleting to to talk and you know, to put on that brave face and put on that mask in a way. And, you know, after I had a great conversation that was, you know, I, I put on that happy face and, you know, did that. And I really, truly enjoyed those conversations. At the end of the day, I was depleted. That was, that was all my energy. It took a lot to build up to that. And then now I need five days to kind of recoup all that energy back. So that's something that has changed. Now I can socialize and hang out and, you know, talk for hours and hours. And the next day I'm rejuvenated. And that's something that I count as a huge victory. And I can attribute it to therapy and medication. Um, and that's not the route for everybody. Um, I know in these, in the next, you know, couple of interviews, we talk a lot about therapy and medication, and that's something that helped me, and that's something that helped some of the moms. But, you know, there's free support groups that have also helped me. There's friends that, you know, even if you don't think they understand, they even if they hadn't gone through it, something that I learned over the course of the, you know, the two years that I was in this, that like, even if friends that you have haven't gone through this or aren't moms, they're there to listen and they want to understand and they want to help. And your friends and family aren't, they don't want to judge you. The people that love you aren't looking at the bad sides of yourself and we're all our worst, our own worst critics. And I think what I realized after finally opening up to my family and opening up to friends about this that, um, you know, that weren't in my inner circle of mental health confidants, I guess, um, finally opening up to them was so healing and so gratifying. And, you know, that's not the route for everybody also, but um, I felt like I had this deep, dark seated secret and now it's out in the open and how freeing that is um and having having a, a i guess a label to put my finger on to what i was feeling 
that also made a huge difference. Um, having to be able to say, yeah, that was postpartum depression, or yeah, that was postpartum anxiety, um, or yeah, that was bipolar depression, which is something that I also got diagnosed with. And that kind of explained a lot of my ups and my downs. Um, and it's bipolar depression too, that I ended up finding out that I probably had all my life and never got help for because I didn't even know it was there. It just kind of all came to the surface when I had my daughter. Um, but it, the depression piece of bipolar depression is what really brought um, a lot of the, I guess, concern that I had. The depression was very low. The highs, they were great. I would clean the entire house. I would be, you know, so excited to just go to the park with my kids, like high energy, heart beating really fast, but it wasn't anything, you know, destructive. It was all, it was all positive in a way. Like I had more energy. I was excited. I was happy. I was talking to my husband and, you know, we were doing adventurous things and, um, the whole house was clean. And then three days later, I was depressed and angry and frustrated and I couldn't pinpoint why. Um, and that's the most frustrating part is when I was so low and didn't know why or so anxious and didn't know why. Um, the medication that I got on was very helpful. It was, you know, it's a mood stabilizer that kind of brings both the highs and the lows in so that I feel, so that I'm more in that stable period. Um, and even though I missed the highest of the highs, that was also not a good path because I would stay up until 2 a.m., have to wake up for my 6 a.m. alarm, which is my children. Um, and so now I feel more stable and I can actually function well. And that's a big game changer. So in a nutshell, <laughs> that's my journey. Um, and it's been hard and it's not like I'm done. I think forever for my life, I'll be in the process of managing it. And right now my journey, like where I am in therapy and where you know my story is, is learning to appreciate and give myself grace for all the time that I missed with my daughter um, in the first year and a half of her life. I can't, I can't look at some of the pictures without feeling like oh, I know how I felt. I know how hurt I was just for nothing, I guess for the way that I was behaving and the way that I was feeling and thinking more so than behaving. Um, it's just all these thoughts come rushing to the surface and these feelings come rushing to the surface of how sad I was and how angry I was. Um, so right now I'm learning to love myself through that period and give myself grace and know that, you know, I wasn't in a good headspace. I couldn't, I couldn't do the most basic functions. How was I supposed to, you know, clean or cook or take the dog outside or take the dog for a walk. Like those little things were very hard that the bigger things got pushed back to the side, which really hindered relationships. It hindered my connection with my daughter. It hindered, hindered my connection with my son and it mostly hindered the connection with myself. So now I feel like I'm getting there and it's going to be something that I manage for the rest of my life, but it's, more healing in a way now that I know what, you know, now that I know what it is. And the education is so important to me. And that's why this group is what it is, because um, we want moms to know what can happen before it happens. It's not enough to find out later. It's not enough to have only education on postpartum depression. There's a lot out there. There's postpartum rage. I didn't know that was a thing. That's a thing. Um, and it's hard. I don't know. Um, I don't know many moms that have gone through it, but the ones that I do 
that is a secret that they feel like they need to keep. And, you know, we're here to say it's not. It's not abnormal. It's not something that you will never get through. There are things you can do to manage. There are things you can do to cope. And we hope that you join our group. And we also hope that the group um, and that these virtual meetings and virtual open talks help you feel seen and heard. So thank you for listening to my story. Um, we're excited to have you here and we're excited to have the moms share their story and be so vulnerable and honest. And uh, I'll take it, I'll switch it over to the moms. Um, thank you for listening. If you want to share your story with us, send us an email at motherhooditr at gmail.com or send us a message on our Facebook page, Motherhood in the Raw RVA. We look forward to hearing more stories from you. Thanks for listening.